is your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet. Here, I'm your host, and this is when sharks attack. Oh, it's not. Oh, this is announcements. What's up, guys? My name is Mitch, and this is announcements. Thank you for the opportunity to let me come at you at 4K. Can you see me? Can you see my brain? sad that it's kind of empty but it's been awesome watching Sunday service and how encouraging it is that we have the opportunity to do that online and gather in our homes and be able to see Nathan and Pastor Ben and their team just get together and really bring us the word and bring in a life through worship and the message that they have um, one thing I wanted to talk to you guys about today before we get to the announcements is encouragement where I'm getting my encouragement from as well as how I'm trying to encourage others one thing that's been super encouraging to me is how God is getting the attention of people that he normally couldn't connect with by corona, by an earthquake. I have people coming up to me and being like, Mitch, God's trying to get our attention. And all I ask is, well, what do you think about that? Why do you think God is trying to get our attention now? And it starts this amazing conversation and allows me to talk to them about scripture. That's been really cool. One way that I'm trying to encourage others is by talking to him about scripture. One of my favorite passages in the Bible, and one that is commonly misinterpreted and misused, is I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now, does that mean that I can step foot on a basketball court after never playing basketball and be like Michael Jordan? I have no idea, but maybe not. But if we look at how Paul is writing the different letters to the churches and his experiences being in jail and going through trials, having his ups and having his downs, it's, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, because that's where we pull our identity from. That's where we get our strength from. We know that that statement is true because God has always been there, will continue to be there, and see us through to the end. And that's been encouraging to me. And now, for announcements. First one that we got, check your inboxes. We sent out information concerning the new sewer project. Um, all the construction, we sent it to all the members, so check those and get that awesome update. The next announcement I got for you guys, take a selfie. The reason that we want to take these selfies is because we really want to see what you guys have been up to. We want everybody to participate, as many people as we can, that way we can get this awesome collage together so we can share with everyone how awesome our church family is during these hard times. So we need you. Now I hope you guys really enjoy worship service with Pastor Nathan. We're gonna pass it on to him. God bless all of you, and I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Hey, thanks.
Thanks, Mitch. We threw you a little curveball here, Mitch. Uh, Nathan's still over there, and I'm here instead, so I'm going to catch the ball instead of Nathan. We want to just welcome all of you, 10 Mile Church, and anyone visiting with us today as we worship the Lord together. It's just a privilege to be able to do this and to share God's word with you today, to worship. I just encourage you to, uh, I know sometimes maybe in your, in your living room, if it's like you and your wife or you're by yourself or whatever to sing, but hey, just act like you're singing in the shower. You know, sing it out because God loves that uh, offering coming up to his ears this morning. So we just want to encourage you to do that. And I just ask you, uh, as we begin today, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to be with us gathering our hearts together, even though we're in different places. Father, thank you so much for the time to set aside to just really honor you and worship you, Lord, as one body. Father, thank you that the church is not, as we saw in this video, it is not brick and mortar, Lord. It's your people. And each one of us, Father, is, is a piece of the temple, and you live within us, God. I pray that you would encourage us today, ground us in your, uh, in your word and your truth, Father, today. I ask that you would just warm our hearts and encourage us as um, we're, we're in an awkward time, Father, but you go before us and you know all things. So you know exactly how to give us strength and bravery to be courageous during this time and to offer hope to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Darkness tries to roll over my bones and Sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know oh, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. She no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. No, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I
day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence, my a moment and go before the Lord in some prayer right now, and uh, I invite you to close your eyes where you are, bow your head, take a big breath in, and let it out, and fix your inner vision on our good Father this morning. The scripture says that we should be still and know that he is God. And I think often it's in the stillness that we really start getting a picture. We start seeing him. And we know that when we, what we fix our attention on, what we, or what we fix our focus on is, is what we, we move toward. And, 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 and we know that that becomes a part of us. And so we're going to talk about identity today. And so the first thing I want you to do is just think about where you find your identity this morning. And as you fix your vision on God, ask him, ask him to give you his identity. The next thing we're going to do is just have a time of gratitude. We're supposed to come before him with thanksgiving. And so um, identify in your heart and mind three or four things right now that you're so thankful to God for because he's been so good to us.
And finally, we know that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. Jesus said, it's actually better that I go so that the Holy Spirit may come and he will lead us into all truth. And as we get ready to sing one more song, before hearing the truth of God's word proclaimed, ask the Holy Spirit to come into your room that you may feel his presence and ask him to lead you into truth this morning. The sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence
It's a great, thanks Dwight, it was a great, uh, great songs this morning, just reflecting on God's presence and just time of personal prayer. Thanks for leading that, Pastor Nathan, really appreciate it. This morning, we are transitioning into a little mini-series that we're calling God's Design, how we interact with others. And some of you were with us as we went through Ephesians here from January, February, early March, but we didn't really dig really deep into chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6 of Ephesians. And so that's what we're going to do and use that as a template of thinking about how we interact, how God's design is for us to interact with others. And so that's what we're going to be starting on today. And thinking today, we're going to focus in on, you'll see this as we read through these first few verses, about God's design, being imitators and finding our identity. Where, where do we find our identity is what we're really going to focus on today, that God asks us to be imitators. So I hope you have a Bible or maybe an electronic device, scripture that you could read along with me. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 14, along with several other passages this morning. So Ephesians chapter 5, would you read along with me? As we look at the truth from God's word. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience." Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us as we share together this morning. Father, we just thank you for what we just read here in Ephesians, the truth that we see there, the encouragement, Lord, and even the comparison between what it means to be children of light and what it means to follow darkness. I pray, God, this morning that your light would shine in the hearts of everyone who hears this word, who listens, Father, and that your spirit would be with them and draw each of us, our hearts, to you this morning, God, wherever Lord, this message finds ears. I pray that those ears would be open to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we get started this morning, we see this in Ephesians 5, those first two verses. Be imitators of God as beloved children 
and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It's, it's an example of what it, would, what it means to be an imitator of God, and we see that displayed in Christ himself. And this idea of being imitators, it relates to our DNA as children of God. When you ask Christ into your life, and there's that healing that takes place because through Christ you become one again with God, as was in the beginning, we become a reflection of our Father. And just have a little picture here. This is me and my son Caleb on the beach, on the Oregon beach here a few years ago. And uh, as you look at this, do you notice there's some imitation going on here? It's, it's interesting the reflection that was caught when Sherry took this picture, the, the stride at our body position, the way we carry ourselves. Um, and of course, he's my son. There is shared DNA going on between me and my son Caleb. One place that we see this, this DNA kind of idea as believers is actually in Galatians 5, uh, verse 22 through 26. And I want to read that. These verses, be, uh, the verses before this, this passage in Galatians actually goes and summarizes the things we're going to look at in Ephesians 2, that it's, it, he first illustrates what it is to live in darkness. And then we get to verse 22 here in Galatians, and we see the DNA of the Spirit. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, what, what's the DNA of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law because they exemplify who God is. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So we've crucified those things, uh, the, the world, the darkness that we read about in Ephesians, we'll look at in a moment. And instead, we live by the Spirit. Let us keep also, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. So again, here is the DNA of Spirit-filled living. The list here is a, of character traits that come straight from the Creator Father. And if you want to take the time and go look in 2 Peter chapter 1, you can read that we, there Peter says it this way. He says, we are partakers in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world. And so that's Peter's take on the same kind of idea that we're we're partakers of the divine nature. Have you ever thought of yourself as because Jesus is in your life that you are a partaker in his divine nature? That's a pretty bold and profound statement. It's one that uh, is super powerful. I love those first view verses in 2 Peter chapter 1. You might want to go read those. And he talks about how then we begin to display these fruits of the Spirit. These verses reference that we, like Christ, have crucified the flesh and we live by the Spirit. And the last statement here in verse 21 relates to what we will be getting into as we continue through this series. He says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. And why? Because that would not be an imitation of God. To do those things, to provoke one another and envy one another, to become conceited is not an imitation. It's not a, an accurate reflection of the God that we serve. So if we look at Ephesians 5 again and look at verses 3 through 10, what we find here is the opposite of God's DNA. So we looked at Galatians 5.22 through 26, and we see God's DNA and what that really looks like when it plays out in our life. But when we look here in verses 3 through 10, Paul takes the time to, to really highlight what the opposite of God's DNA is. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness not, must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, no foolish talk, nor crude joking which are out of place but instead let there be thanksgiving. You see the comparison starts going on. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance with the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. 
And then there's this therefore. Therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. If we just kind of look, go through that a little bit slowly again, verse three, don't let these things be named among you. Among who? Among those of you who are saints. You shouldn't have all these things that he's listed here to be among you at all. And that's a challenge to us. It's, it's, it comes back to that idea of what would it look like if we were all imitating God? It would not look like these things in verse three, four, five, six, but, but what would it look like? Verse four, he says, no talk that tears down or celebrates crude things. And here's a comparison. So no talk like that, but instead there should be thanksgiving. There should be this heart of thanksgiving. And thanksgiving brings joy into our lives. And the question then is why? These things do not reflect the creator. And they do not belong in heaven or in his people here today. And then in verse seven, we see a very bold statement. He says, do, don't be partners with them. And how many times do we struggle because we, we partner ourselves with someone who is that way, and instead of them receiving the joy and hope that we have in the Lord, we begin to, re, to take part in what they're doing. Should, that should never be. It should be the other way around. We should always be able, through God's power in our lives, to refrain and instead bring hope and joy and perspective to those who are caught in darkness. And in fact, in verse 8, then what we see is that he says, walk as children of the light. Well, how, why can you walk as children of the light? Because you have received the light. God shined the light into your life. He, when he drew your heart to himself, he shined his light and you begin to see everything differently. Your perspective in life completely changes when you know God because you begin to see things the way God sees things. So my question is, you know, walk as children of the light. Did you, did you, do you actually hear what he's saying? He's saying, it's your identity. You are children of the light. My question that I want you to be reflecting on today is, do you know who you are? As you're sitting and you're listening and partaking in this, in this worship service, do you know who you are? Let's, let's turn and look at Mark chapter 1, 9 through 11, and we get a picture of how identity works here. This is at the time when John the Baptist, John the Baptist came a little bit before Jesus, and he came to prepare the way, is the way the, the uh, Mark, you can see that in the Gospels in several places, that John the Baptist came to prepare the way. He was out in the desert. He was baptizing people for the repentance of sin. And so when we start here in verse 9, it says, uh, these days, those are the days that it's referencing, the days when John the Baptist was out in the desert baptizing people for repentance and sin. So he says, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. That's worth repeating, isn't it? It's an amazing picture of God confirming the identity of Jesus. Do you see that? You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine God saying that about you this morning? So many places in scripture, God refers to us as his children. Can you imagine God saying to that, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter with whom I am well pleased. Do you know who you are this morning? I want to I diagram this out a little bit and give you away a picture of really what's going on here as, the hev as God, the father in heaven, is speaking down to Jesus, the son. And so the father is in heaven. And Jesus is being baptized. And as he comes out of the water, what does he say? He says, this is my son. This is my son. And everyone heard that. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. And as you think about him saying, this is my son, he is verifying, he's, he's qualifying Jesus' identity 
as his son. So Jesus gets his identity directly from the Father. I am the Son. And as you think about this and you think about the way we work in the world and how sometimes we are so, it's all about what we're doing. It's not about who we are. But what we see here is a picture where between God the Father and Jesus the Son is that the identity is all tied up in who they are, not what they're doing. And as we continue along, you can see in, in Mark 1, uh, 12 through 13, it says that once, right after this happened, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals and angels attended him. So right after this, where Jesus is stepping from really what was into what's going to be, stepping into, into his ministry here on earth, the Spirit leads him out into the wilderness. And we see that, we saw that over Easter, that Jesus was committed to following the will of the Father. And so out of his identity, what we find is that Jesus has obedience. He has obedience because he's committed to the will of the Father. So the Father speaks, says, this is my son. The son has his identity, and out of his identity, he takes action. And when we do that and we know our identity and we take action in that, we're, we are united with the Father. We're one. But the interesting thing is that in the world that we live in, there are two ways that people receive their identity. The first way is what we just described, that it's God's way of grace, that our identity is by who God says that we are, and it's through grace. And when we receive grace, then we take action. We live out of our DNA. It just comes naturally that we begin to live and reflect and imitate who God is in everything that we do. And so our lives are aligned with God in that way. The world's way, however, is different. The world's way is all about performance. It's all about striving and attempting to achieve our identity by what we do and what we accomplish and what others would say about us. And really what you find when you try to find your identity in this way, it becomes bondage. You're in bondage because your identity is all caught up with whether you succeed or not, with whether you accomplish some goal or not, and all those kind of things. And God says, no, that's not where you get your identity. And so a lot of us can probably see that there's a battle between what we hear God saying when we read out of the Bible and we hear God saying about who we are, we're his children, and the conflict between that and what the world tells us is you're not good enough, you didn't measure up, you didn't finish the goal, you didn't complete the task, you messed up. Well, we all know we're going to make mistakes, we're going to trip up. And if our identity is in how well we achieve things, suddenly... We, we're just never, we never find our identity. We're, we're left chasing our identity all the time, trying to find it in all kinds of things. But God has that answer for us because he wants to speak into us about who we are. So I want to ask you this morning, you know, can you, this is who I am. Can you say, this is who I am? Do you know your identity? Not because of what you've been working towards, but because of who God says you are. Have you received your identity? And, and uh, you can look in Luke 15. I'm not going to read this whole passage. Luke 15, 11 through 32, is, it's, a, it's an account of a father who has two sons. And he must be a fairly wealthy father as you read through this. And the youngest son comes to his father. And this seems kind of odd, especially in that culture, that the youngest son comes to his father. He demands his inheritance and the father gives him his inheritance. And then the younger son leaves. And when he leaves, he leaves and lives recklessly and sinfully. You could go back to these verses we read. He, he fell into sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness, covetousness and filthy talk and crude language and all those things that are listed there in Ephesians that we read through. And the interesting thing, though, is that he's still a son. He's not acting like a son, but he's still a son. He spends everything on sinful passions. 
And as he's he squandered everything that his father had given him. A famine comes upon the land and he finds that he has no way to even eat. So he hires himself out and he's feeding pigs. And as he's feeding the pigs, he, he reaches what we often describe as the bottom of the barrel. Everything now is going wrong and he's at the bottom of the barrel. And at, when we get to that place in our life, often is the time when we start reflecting and we think, huh, we try to find our way out of that. And this son, sitting there at the bottom of the barrel in the pig slop, goes, you know, my father's servants are better off than I am right now. I'm going to go to my father, and I'm going to say, I will be your servant. So what we find is that at that moment, when the young man realizes that his servant, that his father's servants are better off than he is, and he resolves to turn, return to his father's house as a servant, that when he does that and he comes back to his father's house, his father runs out to embrace him. He sees him coming and his father runs out to embrace him. But look at what the, what the son does. He stays true to his plan and this is what he says. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you which is an interesting statement. That's repentance, isn't it? I have sinned against heaven and before you. And then he says what he, told, what he said he had committed he was going to say. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He's in bondage. He's in bondage because his identity is tied up in his actions. And that's where a lot of us find ourselves. Our identity is caught up in our actions. And when things don't go quite right, we are caught in bondage. But what I want you to see is what does the father say? This, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Do you see the difference in the viewpoints between the father and the son? It's it's a question, servant or son? And servant or son? And the father says what? Son. He says son with a huge exclamation mark. Bring, bring a robe, bring a ring, kill the fatted calf and all these things. He, he tells all of his other servants because my son who was dead is alive. He is back. So what we see here is that the father informs the identity of the son, just like we saw with Jesus being baptized and coming out of the water and the heavenly father speaks to him and says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And we see the same example here in this account between the father and the son. Actions do not inform our identity. Knowing who we are, it is true that when we know who we are, it leads us to reflect our identity in everything that we do. Those two things are not separate, right? They're not separate. It's, it's a question of how does it flow? It all flows from knowing who you are. And then you begin to, what Paul says here, become an imitator of God as beloved children. It all flows out of that. Your actions and everything you do flows from that and it reflects God. It reflects the character of God. So this week, what I really want us to do is for all of us to consider what, or better, who are we reflecting and imitating in our lives? What a great time. A lot of us have a little bit more time right now a little, a little more time that we could be quiet, as Nathan reflected on, that be still and know that I am God. To, to slow down and to be able to do that. And as you do that, think about what or better who are you reflecting or imitating in your life? Consider your identity. I have a few questions that you might want to jot down just to think about today, uh, this afternoon. It's, it's a time that we can just stop. And I want you to think about, do you know who you are? And as you think about that, how do you know who you are? 
It's really important for us to consider how we know who we are. Because sometimes that's come from, it might have come from parents and it might be really accurate, it might be very godly. It might have been a coach or a teacher or some random person that said something to us or about us in a situation that has just basically scarred our lives and we're getting our identity from that. It's not a true identity, but we've accepted that identity. So we need to think about how do you know? How, how has it come to the place that you think this is my identity? And then the last thing I want you to think about is do you find your value in what you accomplish or who you are? Because as we looked at that diagram, it's so important that it, that it all flows from the Father says who you are, and then from who you are, you begin to reflect and imitate. And yes, you do things and you have action, but it flows out of who God says that you are. And, that, and from that place, we get a lot of confidence. God calls us his children so many times in the Bible. And in John 15, Jesus says he no longer calls us servants, but friends, because he's told us all that we need to know. What, how amazing is that, that we are friends of God? We sing that song sometimes. Another way to say this is, where do you get your value? Do you find your value in what you accomplish, or do you find your value in who you are? I hope that those questions can really sink in and you can look at the truth that we've talked about today and you can really consider, have I ever really stopped and been broken before God and allowed God to speak to me like that father did with his son that went squandered everything, but yet with repentance, he welcomed him back in and called him son. We're going to continue next week and we'll look at how God is welcoming us into a relationship with him that is reflected actually in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we'll continue looking at this us and God relationship first and then we'll move on to some of our uh, more horizontal relationships with people in this world. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you made it possible that for any one of us who humbles ourselves and asks for forgiveness, you look at us and say, oh, there's my son, there's my daughter. Lord, help us to know this as truth. And then God, I, I want to pray one more thing. I want to ask you for one more thing. That those of us who know you, we would find our value in our identity, God. Help us to find our identity and our value. And then Lord, Help us know how, in each situation, how to reflect you to those around us. We can't do it on our own, Lord. Help us to rely on your spirit, that we would live from your spirit's guidance in our lives, and people would see that and have hope. In Jesus' name.
sitting and reflecting on the words of this song. God is a way maker. And as I referenced that young man who had gone and squandered all of his inheritance and he found himself at the bottom of the barrel, you might be sitting wherever you find yourself today watching this service and you might be identifying with him thinking, yeah, I'm at the bottom of the barrel. But there, you might. But in that moment, you have a decision to make because in your own power, at the bottom of the barrel, you don't have the strength to pull yourself out of that hole. And you feel like there's just no way out. And this is like your destiny. But I wanna tell you as, as I hopefully shared today, that God has a completely different plan for you. He has, a, no matter where you're at, no matter what you've done, God, Jesus is a way maker. He's a miracle worker. That's who he is. And he's just waiting for you to look up from the bottom of that barrel and just say, I give up. I, I've tried all, all on my own. I've tried to make my own way and it hasn't worked. And for you to just say, Lord, I need you to cry out to him. And he will look down and he will say, my son, my daughter. And he will rescue you from that place. Because, because of what Jesus did on the cross that we talked about at Easter, Jesus came, he followed God's will. He died on a cross. He was in a grave for three days, but death could not hold him. And he rose again. And, he had, and he's living eternally. And he offers you eternal life this morning. It doesn't mean your life will be perfect. 
It doesn't mean there won't be challenges, but it means that you will be secure as a son or daughter of God. And so I just ask you just to say a simple prayer. You can just say it on your own right now. God, I need you. Forgive me of all the sins and all the far out things that I've done and help me become an imitator of you. I love what Stephen Curtis Chapman summarizes from some natives. He says, uh, he says, God follower. Will you become a God follower today? Would you pray with me right now? Father, I've tried so hard and I've messed up my life. But I, I really tried, I really wanted to do well. But my path has led me to a place that I understand I can't do it on my own anymore. And then ask God, say, God, would you forgive me of all of my sins and my missteps? I want to be your son. I want to be your daughter. Come into my life and change my life. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that you probably can't imagine what God's going to do, but if you just open God's word, turn to the book of John, you can look, at, look it up on your phone. Turn to the book of John and begin reading. Call our church office, 208-362-2620. Ask to speak, uh, to get in touch with Pastor Ben or Pastor Nathan. We would love to talk to you about the decision that you just made and help you understand how God wants to come and rescue you from where you're at.